para nós, um, you know, this moments like this, we always treasure. That's why physical gathering, you cannot really just take it away from the believers because uh, the, the move of God, although of course, via online, I'm saying God is moving also in your house. All of you are watching right now as you are connected to the flow of the Spirit of God. Miracles are also happening in your house. And if you are sick right now, just expect the healing of God. Just the flow. The power of God is so tangible that the, your nerves and your muscle will listen. And healing will flow. We just prayed somebody after the service, uh, first service, uh, someone who is uh, dealing with a cancer of kidney. But we believe that the power of God can just invade that kidney and it will be restored. And of course, we, again, on the other side, we, we just uh, accept the fact that we are in a physical, temporary, fragile world. And, uh, and yet, the God is always with us. Amen? Well, good morning, everybody. Are you blessed today? I am blessed. I'm happy today that I'm here in front of you. I'm tasked to deliver you a message uh, in this season that we are in as a nation. And uh, we, we believe that the church must uh, speak up. There you go. Must sound the voice. Must release the words regarding the season that we are in as a nation. And I want you to listen to me because I am not going to campaign here. I'm going to preach the Word. Can you say amen? Because the Word is the most important thing in our lives as a believer. And today, I, I just would like to share about, and, and I hear the message of Pastor Giselle last Sunday. is awesome, powerful. And thank you, Pastor Giselle, for that wisdom. But uh, at the same time, I'm here to present to you the role of the church and what, who we are, what we need to do in the season just like this. And not only just this season, but in all seasons of this nation. Because we, we live in this nation and we got only one nation. We got only one Philippines. And I love this nation. All of us, we love our nation. Can you say amen to that? That's why you don't want. And if I say nation, we're not talking about lands and uh, geography. We're talking about people. What is a nation without people? So we're talking about people. So if I, talk, I, 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 if I say I love this nation, I love the people of this nation. Can you say that with your seatmates? I love you, nation. Oh, di ba? Kung hindi pa kayo nakikipag-usap sa isa't isa, I love you, nation. People. We love people. We love the culture of this nation. We love the, the, the blessings of this nation. So, the church should understand our role in building this nation. And I believe that the Word of God is so clear of what we're going to do as a believer and as a church. What we need to walk through as a believer, as a church in this nation. Matthew chapter 5, and I will start from here. Verse 13 to 16, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of this world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor, they, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But you are a lampstand. You are a light into a lampstand. And because of that, it gives light to all. Say all. To all who are in the house. So therefore, let your light shine before men. Don't hide yourself. You're the light of the world. So let your light shine before men. That they may see your good works. We as believers will see the good works that is given unto us, being imparted to us, and glorify your Father in heaven. Two identity here, salt and light, and it has been 
discussion previously. But the main use of salt is to preserve, right? Especially during the Bible times. The salt is used to uh, preserve a meat or a fish or a whatever food that needed to be preserved. So when Jesus said, we should live a life that is like salt to the earth, he meant that we should live a life in such a way that our very presence, listen to me, church, our very presence in this world preserve the society. That it will not collapse, it will not disintegrate just because of corruption and all of those uh, unrighteousness and injustices. Our very presence in this, in this world. That's why I, I read somewhere that says the greatest, the, 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 the best strategy for evangelization is a strong local church in the city. Now, we love crusades. That's good. But those are just activities. A local church staying planted in a city, strong, and bringing light to the world is someone who is evangelizing the city and preserving the city. Don't minimize your presence in your offices, in your schools, in your, in your works, in your job, in your family. You preserve uh, the, 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 the society and the family and the community by you being the soul. And if you say light, you give light, of course, in the middle of darkness. You don't, okay, in the salt area, you don't blame the fish if it is decaying. You just ask, where's the salt? You don't blame darkness because it's so dark. You just look for the light. And if a, if a place is decaying, a society is dark, where is the light in that city? Now listen to me. You don't have to be a majority to become a light in a city. A small light can bring light to a very thick darkness. In fact, the thicker the darkness is, however small that light is, will bring light into that place. So don't look at yourself as the, as the minority because the minority can always be used by God powerfully. And we as a church in this nation, I'm, just, I'm not just talking about new life, but the body of Christ. That we need to understand our identity. We are the light and we are the soul. Now, if you say salt, it is a preserving influence. So you preserve your offices because you're there. Because of your life. If you say bringing light, you're pres that is a presenting influence. Now, the, the salt is, is preserving influence. The light is presenting influence. You, you, you bring in light. You present light. To that city and you don't have to struggle to become light you just turn on your light your attitude your character the way you speak the way you deal people turn on your light switch on your life light so pag dating mo doon pa lang sa office click the light because you are the light of that office this means church that being a passive observer of cult culture is not an option. We are militant. Now, I have to be careful with that because we're not talking about violence here. We're not talking about revolution literal here. We're militant because of spiritual power that is in us. So we cannot, we cannot just stay passive observer of the culture that we are in. Again, when there is darkness, God will look for the light. Where is the light in this part of the city? <laughs> if there is decaying in that city, God will look not for 
the decay or blame the decay, God will look for the salt. Where is the salt that I put in this city? Where is the salt here? So the church is called in that. Three things that I would like to share to you that I believe are the most obvious instruction of God to us as nation builder in this, in this nation as a church. Three things. Number one, the prophetic role of the church to the world. The prophetic role. Now, I'm not just talking about prophesying or, you know, being in the prophetic ministry and, you know, trying to pro prophesy the future. No. Uh, prophets in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, as you are, as you, if you read the Old Testament, you can see there are a lot of prophets. Two roles, actually. Foretelling, F-O-R-E, this uh, declaring about the future, and forth telling, F-O-R-T-H. Foretelling is declaring about the future. Foretelling is declaring the now message to the situation. And we are called as a prophet to this nation because we are called to declare God's directions for the future, but God's message for your own situation right now. And the Word of God is so powerful that we use because the prophet is not only just preaching prophecy, they represent God before people. So in a prophetic role, we as a church, we represent God to the world. And we declare and we proclaim the Word of God to the world. That's why we will never stop preaching the gospel in this church because that is our role in this nation. That as we preach the Word and share the Word, we are actually walking the role of prof uh, prophetic ministry or of declaring the message of God. Let me just use he Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 as a reference in the Amplified. By faith, we understand. Say, we understand. That the worlds, the word worlds there is not cosmos, but aeons or aeoness in Greek, which refers to ages and generations. So, to put it in a literal sense, by faith we understand that the generations were framed. The word framed there, katartizo in Greek, is actually a technical term. In fact, it is a it is an engineering term that means to fashion, to mend, to put it in order, to equip for intended purpose. So if, if we will go back to the sentence or to the verse, it says, By faith we understand that the generations are put into fashion, put into order, equipped for intended purpose by what? By the Word of God, not political concept, not political opinion, not man-made system. It's the Word of God that will fashion our generation. In fact, civilization was formed not by human effort. The Word of God is the one that forms a civilization. And so in our generation, it says here, so that what we see was not made out of things which are visible. That means that everything that we do not see, we should, we should believe that it will exist by the Word of God. If there is unrighteousness, we will believe for righteousness by the Word of God. We will declare that. We will preach that. The role of the church is to mend, to repair, to strengthen, to mature, to fashion, to put in order, and to equip our beloved nation of the Philippines. That's our role. And our role is to preach the Word because the Word of God is what we need in this nation. 
It is not a good politician. Yeah? We cannot blame the government. We cannot blame people. The Word of God is needed in this nation to be repaired. Just look at your personal life. How God restored you because you received the Word. How God mend your relationship because you believe on the Word. If God did that in your life, that will be done in this nation one by one also. And so we believe for God's encounter to that people because we preach the Word to people. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Baptizing them in the name of the Father. No, uh, Go therefore, verse 19, and make disciples of all nations. Not politicized, not, uh, not just uh, go there for human ability or human uh, effort. You're a disciple of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all the things that I commanded you. And I am with you always, even at the end of the age. The, the Philippines needs the pure gospel of the word. And who are going to proclaim that if not the church was given the mandate of a prophetic ministry of preaching, preaching the gospel? Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17. And I pray that all of you believers in the house will be your verse. This verse will be your verse. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God and to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. First row. Prophetic role as a believer. We preach the gospel. Second role, Sarah Millet will share this because I do believe that this is our anointing. By the grace of God, yeah. Thank you, Pastor Edwin. The second role of the church in building the nation is the priestly role. Because this is pertaining to this is pertaining to prayer for this nation. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, in the New Living Tra Translation, it says here, And you are living stones. Can you speak that with me? Living stones. That God is building into His spiritual temple. What's more, you are His holy priest. Can you say that with me? Holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. You know what? In the Old Testament, the main role of the priest is to represent people before God. As the prophetic role is we represent by the proclamation of the word God to people. But the priestly role of us as believers, we represent people before God. And the main role, you know, as a priest in the Old Testament, there is this one part of the priestly garment that he is wearing every single time he is ministering as a priest during the Old Testament. And that garment, that part of the garment is what we call ephod or ephod. This is a part of the priest garment wherein there is a symbol in that garment carrying the nation or the 12 tribes in his heart. Because in that garment, there are 12 precious stones. 12, 5, 5, 2, okay. 12 precious stones and different in each stone, it represents a tribe out of the 12 tribes of Israel. What does it mean? It means that the priest, during the Old Testament, he is carrying in his heart every tribe of Israel. Why is he carrying this tribe in his heart? So that he can pray for them in behalf of them. And in the, in the, one of the functions also of the, of the high priest is you know, because this part, you know, this part of, of the temple also, there's a furniture in the temple, which is what we call the altar of incense. Okay, so with the garment, okay, the 12 tribes carrying in his heart. And then there's also a furniture in the Old Testament temple, which is called the altar of incense, which is placed in the middle part, in the middle court, because the temple has three parts, right? 
the outer court, wherein the sacrifices and the offerings are being done, and then the middle court, wherein this altar of incense is placed. And the priest is visiting this place every day. Unlike the Holy of Holies, the, the high priest is visiting that once a year. But when it comes to the altar of incense, wherein there is a furniture that represents the place of prayer. Day after day after day. So in this light, we can really understand what is holy priest? What is why we are called as that? Because we are called to pray for our nation every single time, every single day. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, verse 1, Therefore I exhort first of all, can you say that with me? First of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And not just all men, but for kings and all who are in authority. What's the purpose? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And the next verse. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who desires? This is the desire of God. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So in that verse, we can realize what is the prayer target that we are praying for our nation. And then it says here in verse 5, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So uh, the priestly role, if I may call it the priestly call of the church to build this nation is for us to pray. This is pleasing to our God. And we can say that prayer is the first of all. So this is not the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, but this is the first. So we as believers, we as believers, we are called to pray. And I remember in Psalm chapter 2, pertaining to the role of the priests, having in his heart through a garment, symbolized by the garment of those precious stones, carrying in his heart the 12 tribes of, tribes of Israel. So does it mean that the prayer of the priest is exclusive for Israel only? I don't think so. Because in Psalm chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, 7 and 8, it says here, the father is talking to the son. It says here, the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And then the, this is the one. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. I believe Philippines is one. Philippines is one. And just like Pastor Edwin had said, we are not talking about not just the geographical location, though God can bless the land, the soil. God can bless the water. God can bless the air, the natural. But we are aiming the people, the people, our people, our Kababayans, our nation, that we cannot pray for someone that we are not carrying in our hearts. But when we carry the nation in our hearts, then we pray with all our heart. And what does it mean that when we pray with all our heart, we release our faith? Where? To the Word of God. We release our faith and our agreement to the promise of God claiming it for our people, for our nation. And so in 2 Chronicles, verse, chapter 7, verses 14 to 16 from the New King James Version, if my people, who are God's people on the earth right now? We are. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And then the next verse. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. And then it says there, for now I have chosen and sanctified this house. The house of God, the temple of God, that my name may be there forever and my eyes... And my heart 
will be there perpetually. God expects, calls His people for us to humble ourselves before Him. And in prayer, we supplicate, we intercede, we make petitions, we ask God to move amongst, in, upon our people. Can I say, and can I hear from you an amen? Yes. Amen, amen. In Isaiah 56 verse 7, it says here, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and will fill them with joy. Where? In my house of? In my house of? In my house of? Prayer brings peace. Why? Because when we pray, all the burdens that we carry, we entrust to the bigger hand of God. In prayer, with all the many limitations that we know and we understand and then we see. The limitation of the strength and of the wisdom and the ability that we have. But when we pray, we access the unlimited. We access the one who is able. And I, I, you know what, Ephesians 3.20, who is able to do exceedingly above we could ever ask, think, or even imagine according to the power that works in us. And that power is the love of God. Amen and amen. And then my last verse in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corner of the streets that they may be seen by men. And then assuredly I say to you, they have their reward. God is not against corporate prayers. God is not against public prayers because we do it. We do it. But He is so against with, yes, we just did. He's, that He's so against with hypocritic or hypocrite prayers. What is that? Hypocrite means you are not giving your heart to what you are praying. Have you seen a person who asks you of help and then that person is not expecting your help anyway? Why you ask and then you aren't expecting for an answer? That's hypocrisy to me. When you ask God, God bless me. Hypocrisy is you are not expecting. But the truthful prayer, you are expecting because you are so sincere in your asking. Amen. And then at the same time, it says here in, in the verse, I think it's verse 7. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. God is not against persistent prayers. You pray until something happens. But he's so against with mindless repetitions. So, sometimes they are asking, Pastor, is it okay to repeat the prayer? As long as, as long as you are persistent, you are asking because you expect. You are asking, you keep on asking. There is persistency until you find and you receive the answer. Amen, amen. And then at the same time, the last but not the least. In this manner, in verse 9, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven when you pray and you are in the presence of God you can ask big things because God is so even willing to bring heaven's realm on the earth where we are living in so when you ask you ask big time and then you receive big time. You expect that something is happening when you utter a word. And even before a word is being uttered from your mouth, you know that you know that God hears and God is able to answer. Hallelujah. Priestly role of the church for the nation. Wow. Whew, amazing. Two roles, you know. First, as a, pre, as, a, as a prophet, it's a powerful force. God's word, if it is proclaimed, it shapes a generation. It shapes 
mindset and culture. The Word of God is so powerful. So we, we declare that. Priestly role, we pray. That's why don't minimize uh, preaching of the Word and prayer. Prayer is not just a meeting of old people, you know, in the church. And, uh, you know, this, <laughs> no, I'm sorry for that. But prayer is powerful. Can you say amen to that? That's why when we pray, and I, I, we have 12, 21 days of prayer uh, every, every day for the nation. Something is happening because we are praying. And that's our role. And third is servility. Servility role. Now, the word servility from the word serve, it is an excessive willingness to serve and to help others. Excessive. That's the, the description there. That means you are passionate, you are generous, you are all out to serve other people. You're not just serving other people because of string attached or because of popularity or because of, of, uh, of being known by, by the people that you're helping. Now, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God demonstrates His own love towards us. And the word demonstrate there means there is a practical, tangible expression. There's a there's a, a, an action more than just words. So God did not just say, I love you, but He demonstrated it to us. By what? By giving His only Son so that, you know, that in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. So when Pastor Stephen a while ago said, I love you to death, this is love to death. That means God will be willing to give His life for your salvation. That's a demonstration. It is an expression of, of love to other people by doing something to bring change or to bring blessing to other people. And the church is called in that, in that sense that we are to serve. We are not just here gathering just to satisfy our religious, uh, religious uh, desire. Oh, maten na ako ng church. Okay na ako. No, no, no. We are here. We are gathering. Because we know we are going to be blessed so, but, so that we can be a blessing during the week. You know, in, 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 in the Lord's Supper, John chapter 13, verse 2 to 5, it says, and, and, the supper, and, and supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, uh, Simon's son to betray him. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father has given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose, after, uh, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with towel with, towel with which he was girded. So as you can see here, what Jesus did is an example and demonstration. He's demonstrating to the disciples how to serve, and how to do that. Look at in verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father has given all things into His hand, and that He had come from God and was going to God, Jesus in serving knows a very foundational uh, attitude in serving. He knows His authority, He knows His identity, and He knows His destiny. In serving, you need to know first your identity. You are a child of God, precious before God. You are not supposed to just be a servant, just, you know, uh, to, to be used by other people. No, you know that you are a child of the King. And because of that, not only your identity, but your authority. That you have the authority that comes from Him. And your destiny, you belong to God and you will go to God. And because of that, you will serve, not out of insecurity or out of string attached. You will serve because you want to help people. Because you have the ability to do it because of authority. You have the security to do it because of identity. And you know that you have a future in God. 
That's why you'll not get something out of those people that you're helping. Because your reward is from heaven. Serving in Jesus' demonstration is a powerful, powerful expression of our role. In fact, in this uh, scenario, in this uh, uh, event, when Jesus is washing the feet after that, He said, I want you to do that also to one another. I want you to serve one another. Now, this is not just for the church. Can we serve our nation? Can we help our nation? You know, I mentioned this in the first service. We don't have any rights to complain if you are not helping. If you are so always just complaining and complaining and blaming the government and the people and, and, the, and the leaders and all of that, and this Philippine has no hope and no, you hate the world. No, did you do something to help? Did you pray? Did you give something? Let's help our nation. We don't want to put down our nation. We love our nation. And listen to this, people. You are a believer first before you are a Filipino. And being a believer, you express your action to help because you are a believer, you love God, and then, you know, you love the people. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we, we can have something to offer and to serve other people because we have a culture that belongs to the kingdom of God. A culture that brings genuine love and help to other people. And I really am so blessed. And of course, I believe that other churches are also doing that. I'm so blessed to be part of this family, particularly this local church, because you're demonstrated compassion. You're generous in giving. You have, we have seen how you responded whenever we help other people. We, during calamities and crisis, your giving is actually like amazing. You were able, you know, the team from New Life Community Care Foundation just came from Surigao and completed the house building program there for those victims of the typhoon. We're feeding people. This is, this is not actually just a, an activity for political reason. This is our nature because it is our heart to be of help in any way we can. In any way we can. People, you don't have to be rich to help other people. Whatever you have. You have two fish and five loaves of bread. Jesus said, that's good enough. Put it in my hand. Let's bless the, bless the people, 5,000 of them. What do you have that you can be a blessing to other people? Let's help our nation. Let's demonstrate the kingdom culture. As a Filipino believer, demonstrate the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And what is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love, joy, peace. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. Long suffering, kindness. Don't be nasty. You know, oh my gosh. I have to control myself because sometimes this season, people are nasty. Church, please be kind. Kindness, goodness, what? Faithfulness, gentleness, self. What is that again? Some people cannot actually like say that word, control, self-control. Demonstrate not only the spirit of of this, uh, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, but demonstrate love. And you know, I was just mentioning this a while ago. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we use it for marriage or for wedding, for Valentine's Day, but it's good. No, it's good that we can use that. But in context, my dear people, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is not for wedding. It's for giftings. Paul is discussing your ability. You can speak in tongues. You can prophesy. You can preach. But if you do it without love, 
it's nothing. Even though you burn your body without love, it's nothing. So, he goes on to say, you have to do it in love. And love means you suffer long. Love is kind. Does not envy. Does not parade itself. It's not proud. Does not behave rudely. I pray that believers, Filipino believers are not rude. Can I hear an amen from that? Does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Doesn't think of evil. It's not rejoicing in iniquity, but rejoicing in truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endure all things. Do you still believe that this nation is blessed? Do you believe that this nation is going to prosper? Do you believe that corruption will be over in this nation? We can always believe for that. And compassion is the most powerful force that we can show to people. That in the midst of chaos and darkness and injustice and righteousness, compassion is the most powerful force that you can help to a nation. I will read this, and this is the last verse that I will read. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 to 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, teaching, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among people. But when he saw, the word so there is not just physical seeing. There's something in his heart that moves him what he saw. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. And I pray that you will see that also in our nation. You will see in the eyes of Jesus, in the eyes of compassion. Not try to complain, put down, be rude. You will see that this nation is loved and precious before God. You know, Pastor Millet mentioned about that ephod of a priest. The reason why it's all gems, because it represents preciousness, value. In the heart of God, you are valuable. You are important. And their names are written in every tribe because you are not only precious, but you are known by heaven. And this nation is precious before God. You are precious before God. You love this nation. You preach the word in this nation. And you serve this nation. And we are going to build the generation of this nation. Are you with me? With that? Can you commit yourself to be a builder of this nation in this role? Can you say amen to that? We will do it. And we will not do it just because it's almost election now. No, no. After election, what, what will happen? No, no, we will continue. We will do our role as a church in this nation because we believe that the hope of this nation is Jesus. Come on, let's give a clap offering to you. And before I close, here, on-site and online, talking about the gospel and the only answer to people and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The only thing that you need to do to start a new life in Christ is to receive Him in your life. You just commit your life unto the Lord. And we will pray if you haven't received the Lord Jesus in your heart, you know, God's heart is with you. He's been waiting for you to give your life and also to Him. Why not today make a decision? I want to give my life to the Lord. I want to serve Him. And I want to be part of this family that brings change to this nation. If that's you, you can pray. Everybody bow down your head and close your eyes. Make it personal and private right now. If it is you who wanted to receive the Lord Jesus, I want you to just follow this prayer after 
for that. If that's you, you just, just leave up your hands for a few seconds so that I will know. Anybody who wants to receive the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. And to those who are online, you want to receive the Lord Jesus, just repeat this prayer after me. And say this with me. Lord God, I thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for the forgiveness of my sin rose from the dead for a new life for me I open my heart invite him to come in be the Lord of my life and from this day forward I will follow you O Lord Jesus I will serve you thank you God in Jesus name